bringing you a steady stream of thought-provoking ideas and cutting-edge innovation. You're listening to Society and the State, Life, Liberty, and Your Pursuit of Happiness. Now, your hosts, Connor Boyack and Brian Hyde. Hey, everybody. Welcome to today's episode. This is number 90 of Society and the State. I'm flying solo because I'm actually joined in studio by my mom. Hi, Mom. <laughs> Hello. So uh, my mom has been an estate planning attorney for, I don't know, three decades, something like that. And where we talk about life and we talk about your pursuit of happiness, I had the thought that so many people um, are not thinking about the future and not thinking about long-term planning. So, I mean, there's the whole life insurance thing, but then there's the estate planning side um, that I think is really valuable to focus on to make sure you're actually protecting um, those things that we're working so hard to build. So, Mom, let's start here. What is, and I should say for the purposes of, of other people, you're not Mom. Your name is Marilee Boyack, and people can Google you and, you know, mm-hmm. find out uh, all about you. Um, uh, my mom and I compete for how many books we're each writing. So she's also a prolific author and public speaker, and um, but uh, expert in estate planning. So maybe let's start there. And uh, what is uh, estate planning? How would you define that? Uh, well, actually, first, let's kind of get on the table. I'm an estate planning attorney. I think people need to, to know that sometimes. They don't know that there are attorneys that specialize in this. Um, estate planning at its fundamental is planning for death or disability. So that if you're incapacitated in a car accident, what's going to happen? If you die, what's going to happen? Um you know, what's going to happen to your family, your assets, uh, those kinds of things. And so estate planning encompasses planning for all of those um, absolute eventualities. Now, most people just think will, right? Like I have to write a will. Is that is, is that all estate planning really is? Or what are kind of the other pieces of estate planning that most people would have to think about or worry about? Yeah, I see uh, a lot of people with the mindset of, uh, you know, that a will is enough. And typically a will is not enough. Uh, a will does not deal with disability. Uh, for that, you need uh, typically durable powers of attorney. Durable meaning they last even if you're incapacitated. And so you want powers of attorney that are going to handle your financial affairs. You're going to want uh, powers of attorney that handle medical and you know health-related decisions. Uh, and, and then in dealing with death, uh, a will is, for most people, uh, not enough. Uh, a trust, a living trust, a revocable trust um, is typically the preferred mechanism for dealing with these things. And is that something, so, you know, let, let's let's assume that the average person listening is, you know, maybe in their 30s, they've got, you know, a couple kids, younger family. Um, obviously, you know, like life insurance or like anything else, you want to have that plan set because you never know what will happen. But if you're confident that you're going to live for a while and things are going to go for a while, um, you know, is, is it uh, prudent to put that off or, or how, how early should people be setting this up? Should a single bachelor be putting it up, should, uh, sh- setting it up? Should newlyweds be working on this? What, what's kind of the, the time range when it's uh, time to start engaging an estate planning attorney to set some of these things up for your family? Well, you know, it's interesting. I have clients who have adult children. And they realize the minute that child turns 18 that the parent no longer has legal uh, control or access to the child. Uh, So, for example, I I had a hairdresser once upon a time. She was only 25, very young, um, but she was in a boating accident, uh, landed on her head, was in a coma for four months. And there I was uh, in court rapidly trying to get her husband appointed her legal representative Uh, so that they could do the medical things they needed to do, that he could handle the financial things. And and I felt really bad because, you know, at that point in time, for 50 bucks, she could have gotten a power of attorney uh, that would have saved thousands and thousands of dollars in legal fees. So the minute you turn an adult, you need to prepare at the very least for incapacity in whatever way. You know, car accident, serious illness, or even, you know, you're traveling in Europe and need something done with your college uh, things that you need to have someone named as your legal representative. As far as dealing with death, uh, there's a couple of benchmarks there. One is your family circumstance. So if you have children, the minute you have children, uh, it's probably important to get your estate planning done. It, It always amazes me when people don't do it. And I think, my gosh, you know. All of us are going to die 100% guaranteed. 
Uh, and, and if your your children are important to you, then you might want to get these things in place to, to protect them. The other issue is the level of assets. Every state has a threshold amount of assets, uh, whether or not it will trigger probate. And let me pause for one second and talk about probate. Probate is the court proceeding after you've died to transfer your assets over to whoever they're supposed to go to. Mm -hmm. Um, It is not always triggered. It depends on how you hold your assets and what state you live in. Um, But uh, probate is always something that we work to prevent. And like I say, every state has a threshold amount. So, for example, in California, if you have more than $150,000 worth of assets, that would trigger then a probate, uh, typically for a single individual. Um, in the state of Utah, that threshold amount is lower. It's $100,000. And, and like I say, every state has a level of if your assets are worth more than that and you have assets standing in the name of a single individual, then it will trigger a probate. And so that's why we do the trust is to avoid that. Mm-hmm. Now, I've, I've heard, from what I understand, I, I've heard some people pitch estate planning as a way to shield your assets from the government when you die. What what does that look like? Like if I have um, if I have no trust and I have no will, is it is that a tax thing or is that like the government takes a certain cut unless it's protected? Is that more a financial uh, thing uh, with investing and not so much with my assets? Does that come into play with this estate planning or am I totally off base there? Oh, no. And, and that's a good question because people worry that if they haven't done estate planning, it's all going to flow to the state. And that is not the case. Um, it it may cost you a lot of money to get it to who it belongs to uh, through that probate process, but it's not you you know usually going to revert to the state unless you have absolutely no family on the planet. Mm -hmm. Uh, But the one thing that used to be a huge concern is estate taxes. Um, Estate taxes, this shows how long I've been practicing law. Uh, When I first started practicing, if you had more than $250,000, including life insurance, you were subject to estate tax. That number has significantly changed. That number is currently about $11 million uh, per individual that you can pass without paying estate tax. Uh, that's the current number. That that number is changing, by the way, uh, year over year. But right now, up roughly $11 million that you can pass without paying any taxes on uh, the assets that are going to pass. So is it, I mean, it sounds like the way you're describing it, if someone doesn't prepare and get their durable power of attorney or their will or whatever, it's not like all is lost, at least how it sounds to me, that you can get into court and argue, as you pointed out, that the spouse should have the right to make medical decisions or that the children should you know, split assets uh, even though there was no will or whatever. Is it more that this isn't so much an impossibility after death or after a medical incident, but that the legal process is much more complicated and therefore costly? And so this is really a cost-saving thing more than anything to do it preemptively? Or is there some opportunity where things go sideways and those assets aren't protected or or something does go wrong and you can't, after the fact, fix it? Um, and so you do need to, to prevent it up front. It's primarily uh, cost, convenience, and control. So on the one hand, you want to reduce those costs. So every state has in plan uh, a plan for you um, if you don't do anything. But it's very expensive to get there. Uh, you know, in, for example, in the state of California, the probate fees are just, they're set by state, you know, there's state guidelines on what those probate fees are. They're astronomical. Mm. Um, I make an average of probably 600 bucks an hour. I mean, mm. it's ludicrous. Uh, and, and you contrast that with if you had a trust, I typically handle those in a phone call or two. You know, the person's off and running and they're not paying these exorbitant thousands and tens of thousands of dollars of legal fees. Uh, The other thing is you have that uh, convenience. If you have to, if you're incapacitated, you know, so, for example, with the head injury, everything came to a screeching halt until I was able to get into court and and get the husband appointed. Everything had to stop. Um, Whereas if you have an estate plan, you just show them, here's my power of attorney, boom, away you go. You, there's no pause, um, you know, there's no, you know, suspending of anything. It just carries on immediately. And then the third thing is control. You want stuff to happen the way you want it to happen. So you don't want your creepy cousin Louie to end up being 
the <laughs> you know custodian of your kids, right? You want to tell who who's going to take care of your children. Um, you don't want you know your whacked out you know Aunt Tilly being handling the money. You want to be able to control what's going to happen, who's going to be involved, and how things are going to play out. Now, now you were just listing some hypotheticals of you don't want this to happen, and and they were all um, you know theoretical it was all um you know random examples but over the years you've shared with me not a few examples of clients you've had who um, have had things gone sideways so maybe let's take an opportunity to uh scare the listeners if you will by saying like (laughs) you don't want this to happen to you so what what story comes to mind um that you could share um to illustrate the importance of having these preventative measures in place even if you don't have a ton of assets, even if you're just a small family getting started, but share with us a client story um, that can help illustrate, um, you know, the the danger of of not setting up your estate planning. Well, and I can share several, and I'll just share them in broad terms so I don't violate confidentiality. Um, you know, we've had fam- situations where the parents have passed away in a plane accident, and the two sides of the family were duking it out over the children. Huge protracted battles, uh, very, very painful, uh, very, very painful for the children. Uh, just because, I mean, the parents could have done, written it down, you know, and done it for, you know, virtually free even, um, and avoided all of that. I've got others that, uh, you know, they didn't do, I, I just had one, the woman only owned a little house in California, and it ended up. You know, the legal fees were over $10,000 just to transfer this little house Mm. um, in California that that could have been, you know, she could have done a trust for, you know, she could have done a whole estate plan for under a grant and taking care of all of that. Uh, You know, we've got um, others where they have, you know, been protracted battles with the stepchildren. Um, I've got three families like that uh, with very significant. and, And in fact, those actually operated in the reverse Uh, In all three of these circumstances, they had done good, solid estate planning. And when the stepchildren stepped forward, when the first spouse died, and they were, all three instances, very cruel and unkind uh, in demanding their money right away. And, you know, uh, good estate planning in that case saved those surviving spouses big time. I can't even begin to tell you. And thousands and thousands of dollars worth of, of legal fees. Uh, the other thing I see is when people don't do estate planning with minor children, what happens is the children inherit their money at the age of 18 by law. If you don't have a trust saying, no, 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 wait until they're 25 or 30, no way, they get it at 18. Um, and virtually 100% of those cases, that money has been gone in two years. Mm. That the kids, they, they're 18, they don't know, and they just, and they have friends and, you know, and hardy, they just, hardy. correct, it's gone. Um, so, yeah, the horror stories are long. And you've also dealt with people who are now talking to you wanting to set up estate planning, but you've been amazed at the lack of forethought in long-term planning, right? You're encountering people who, I, I guess it's good that they're talking to you about estate planning, but in conjunction with that, they're not really prepared, right? Are you kind of seeing that writ large with a lot of your clients? Oh, yeah. I, uh, I have been really shocked. Um, the level of savings in this country is going to be just horrendous. I've, I've got clients coming in, just had one in, uh, the guy's 60 years old and they had 500 bucks in their bank account and that was it. Um, had another one in a few weeks ago and they had 10 grand and they were in their sixties. And I just look at them and I go, so you're never going to retire. You know, I had one guy who was a school bus driver and he says, Oh no, I'm going to keep driving. I said, there comes a point when you are unsafe. <laughs> they, they won't let you. They won't let you. And, and I have been pretty shocked at the lack of retirement planning. Um, I get couples in. We just had one. Uh, the husband was killed and uh, uh, someone strayed over and killed him head on. Uh, no life insurance for the family, you know. Mm. And here's this woman with five little kids and who's been out of the workforce. And all of a sudden, she's got nothing, you know, mm. and, and bills to pay. And so I'm seeing this over and over again. Uh, of people down to, in fact, it's funny, just uh, uh, friends of ours just yesterday were talking about the fact that the husband and wife did not know each other's passwords on the computer, you know, and, and it was like, 
if something happened to them, you wouldn't be able to access <laughs> all their information. And I'm getting a lot of ki- adult children where they're seeing your parents pass and they go, I can't get onto their computer. And so, you know, planning takes all kinds of aspects. I've heard about that a lot with Bitcoin where you get these uber nerdy guys who have millions, but their wives ha- would have no, no clue <laughs> where it's stored, how to access it, yeah. what to do. And, um, yeah. okay. So wrap, wrapping up here, um, cause I don't want to overwhelm people. This is more meant to plant a seed, be familiar with it. Now, now go do it. You mentioned kind of in passing that, you know, someone could get their entire estate planning done in around like a thousand bucks or something. Is that kind of reasonable or what, what kind of costs broadly speaking, can someone expect if they're new to this, they've got a young family, and they're like, hey, we want to get things figured out. And and those fees really vary state to state. I practice in Utah and California, and I charge probably 25% less in Utah just because that's what the market will bear. Um, I would say for a married couple with uh, children in real estate, I'd say you're looking at about an average of about 1500 Now, that's going to be a little bit higher in states like New York and Massachusetts and California. And, uh, and perhaps Florida and a few others, it'll be a little bit lower in other states, maybe down to, you know, 13, 14, maybe even down to 1,200. What's nice about this is you get a full-blown estate plan and you're good to go. It isn't like, you know, car insurance and house insurance that you're having to pay every year. You get that estate plan and, and so it's well worth the investment. Don't you then, as you have new children, would you have to then be revisiting it and updating no. it or what does that look like? No, our, our documents typically draft for future uh, future children. And so, no, you don't have to do any changes. It's about the only change that I find clients have to make is once their children reach adulthood, then they want to go, okay, I'm going to put my kids in. Um, I very trustingly have put you in as our Sweet. next in line. <laughs> so good luck with that. Um, so yeah, once their kids are adults, then you're going to revise that. And then for a single individual um, typical, I would say would be anywhere from 800 to 1200 range. Uh, depending on the state that you're in, and it and you know it's really critical for single individuals to get that estate planning done because they typically don't have joint accounts, they don't have legal representatives, and and that kind of thing. So you want to get that in place. Okay, final question. Well, second to last question here. <laughs> you get you've got services like Legal Zoom and these self help things online. Should uh, have you ever worked with anyone who's who's got their estate planning started that way? Is it is it prudent or appropriate or sufficient to just fill out a self-help uh, estate planning form online and, and you know, print it off and one and done? Or what have you seen there? Yeah, um, I always say to people, you wouldn't operate on your own brain tumor. Uh, this is not an area of law that's a simple fill in the blank. Uh, you really need to know what you're doing. And, and almost... Okay, there was only one. But in all my years of looking at other people doing that kind of thing, I have found fatal flaws in every single one, except for only one was able to pull it off. So this is nothing to tread lightly. Uh, This is nothing to just kind of wing it on your own. In fact, I have seen and I reviewed it with them and said, do you realize this is what would happen? They're like, oh, that's not what I wanted at all. Mm -hmm. You know, and and I go, yeah, this isn't something that you go cheap on. It just isn't. So how should an individual go about looking for an estate planning attorney? Final question. So obviously, if they're in Utah or California, they can go Google Merrily Boyack and and find you. But, you know, in other states or even in in those states where they want to do their due diligence, uh, is there... um, variety between attorneys that they do want recommendations and this kind of thing, or are most attorneys kind of going to do the same, you know, stuff? How should someone go about looking for the right attorney? Okay. The first thing is you are looking for an estate planning attorney. That is not, you know, your cousin Ralph that just got out of law school and it's not your business law attorney or your tax attorney that just kind of says, oh, sure. I'll throw together a will on the side. No, no, no. You want to find someone that this is their specialty. Good sources for that are talking to other people uh, and say, who have you used to do your estate planning? Referral is a great way. Um, accountants and financial planners are great sources of referral. Mm. I get referrals from them constantly because often people are going into their accountant regularly and then they think about, well, I should do this. And so talking to your accountants and financial planners uh, are good. I, I would say if you're over $11 million, by all means, go for the big law firms and, and do all the bells and whistles. Uh, if you are under that, which you know, ninety nine point nine percent of us are, right? You're going to look for a small to medium sized firm, uh, probably small, 
Uh, you don't want to pay for the fish tank and the marble desk, okay? You you want to go reasonable. So go for a very small or medium-sized firm. You can ask them, how many estate plans do you do? You know, uh, how many do you do every year? You know, how many living trusts do you do every year or revocable trusts? And, and just flat out ask them. Um, the one thing you cannot do is say, can you give me a list of your clients to talk to? Nah, we're not allowed to do that. Mm-hmm. But But you can get referrals from other people and say, you know, did you like them? Then I would say ask for a free consultation. I have people in all the time for a free consultation because you want to know, are, you know you're going to have a lifetime relationship typically with this person. The, and you want to make sure that they're going to educate you, that they're going to listen seriously to your concerns, that they're aware of the personal aspects. There's a lot of personal aspects that have to do with estate planning as opposed to just the technical and legal stuff. You know, are you going to be a good fit for our family? Uh, and, and you just kind of listen and trust your gut in that, uh, in that first interview with the attorney of whether or not you're going to get along. And if it doesn't feel right, walk out the door, you know, uh, you don't have to pay and, and, or shop around two or three and say, you know, which one, which one's a good fit. I I mean, I deal with attorneys all the time and some of them, Oh, heavens no. You know, I would, I would never retain these people. You know, if they pat you on the head and say, don't worry about it, yes, yeah, you're right, bye. <laughs> you know, right. you want someone that's going to be a collaborative team member with you, uh, someone that you can trust, someone that you can ask questions and work with forever. So, Marilee Boyack, if uh, folks want to learn more about your law practice or other stuff you're doing, where can they find you online? MarileeBoyack.com. Marilee is M-E-R-R-I-L-E-E. MarileeBoyack.com uh, is my go-to website for all things and I'm the only Marilee Boyack in the world, so you should have no trouble finding me. <laughs> and in, in case you do, if your Google prowess is not uh, like my own, we'll link to it today on the show notes page, which is societyinthestate.com slash 9090. So you can grab the link there. Uh, guys, stick around for next time. Uh, we're going to be talking with Brian, Brian and I, about if property rights actually exist. So stick around next time. Mom slash Marilee Boyack. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. You bet. Thanks for listening to Society and the State. For show notes, archives, and more great content, visit societyandthestate.com.